So basically, if you're familiar with the story of Only Myself Left the Conquer, you're pretty much going to be familiar with this one, okay? It follows the perspective of a young Kang just kind of living his life as he gets pulled out of time by an older version of himself. The whole thing would be a sort of cat and mouse game throughout all of time and space, with the older version attempting to teach as much as he can to the younger version before he's killed and erased from the timeline by an as-of-yet unknown pursuer. Oh. Oh. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. Mm. Good. Okay. Standing up this time. Good. Looking, looking okay. Looking uh, a little heavier after the holidays. A little standing up today. I think I already said that. Okay. Hey, hi. Hello. It's your boy Goose. Subbing, liking, all that shit and, you know, whatever. Let's get right to it. Okay. Now, I'm going to be looking this way pretty often because this is where my script is. We got to get through this. Okay. It's very, there's very important, very important stuff that we got to discuss. Very important. Okay. It's very important. Now, I've seen a lot of the recent news about the movie projects being pushed out further and farther away into the unknown by Marvel. And while I don't think I have any more uh, unique or better for the MCU ideas than um, other more qualified individuals already in their positions writing and imagining things for the universe marvel excelsior and all that stuff you know that's 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 where i'm headed okay so here's goose i just want to dip in again and expand on something that i kind of touched on a little bit in the beginning basically i i just want to explain that i don't know why i'm getting so close right now i just want to explain that i don't really expect this to be like a pitch per se but what i am trying to do is i would like to transition into something in the entertainment industry at some point probably from a creative role and what i'm trying to do with these is just kind of build a body of work build like a portfolio you will if if it pans out it pans out if not cool but i just want to have like sort of a repository of my ideas on here on YouTube just so that I can have something to offer should I ever be given the chance to be creative and be told like hey give me your best shot kid I'll be like here's a link to my video Bada -bing. Back to the video. So today what I have for you is a fun little jaunt into my creative juices uh, where I will share my vision for how I'd handled the as of yet nebulously named Kang slash Doom slash Dynasty slash War slash Imperative slash Ice Cream Bar. If you enjoy this sort of uh, pitch idea, this sort of gimmick, sort of fun speculation sort of thing, then subscribe and comment, let me know, uh, or feel free to give suggestions on how I might change my setup. I'm Just make sure that you stay tuned for uh, stuff like how I would have done New World Order, which will probably never see the light of day, as, as well as how I do uh, season two, yes, season two of Secret Invasion, I know. Accepting Major's inclusion is canon, but also accommodating for any changes that might happen around that. The Thunderbolts one is really special to me. This one will be two things, two videos, if you will. In one, uh, it'll be th in this one, this this particular one right here. It'll be a take on what I would have done for the Kang-centric dynasty uh, imperative sort of movie uh, we've already been expecting, and likely in a part two, which may come out in a couple of weeks. It will be a take on how I would switch it over to being a Doom movie that actually brings Doctor Doom into existence into the Marvel zeitgeist, if you will. Again, I said that twice. That's right. I'm sticking with it. That one would actually be quite a bit different and have a Molecule Man origin story, as well as a crazy twist and a huge cliffhanger setting up Secret Wars. First though, forthcoming is the Kang one. The Kang. The Kang pitch. So basically, if you're familiar with the story of Only Myself Left the Conquer, you're pretty much going to be familiar with this one, okay? It follows the perspective of a young Kang, or aka Nate, just kind of living his life as he gets pulled out of time by an older version of himself. Neither of these have to be played by majors, by the way. The whole thing would be a sort of cat and mouse game throughout all of time and space, with the older version attempting to teach as much as he can to the younger version before he's killed and erased from the timeline by an as of yet unknown pursuer. The movie would start out with the clip of Majors getting pulled into the engine at the end of Quantumania. As he falls into the endless void of the engine, again, this can be zoomed like way, way, way out, not needing to show his face or anything, like maybe a CG sort of stuff, in a kind of Zack Snyder zoomed out hand cam type shot. As he falls, countless versions of himself spread out through the space, as with what happened with Scott when he was in the engine. This is sort of the birth of like Kang's spread throughout this, this sort of, I gotta kill all the all of myself in the multiverse in order to gain power theory that he develops, which is sort of 
the reason why he's trying to t teach Nate anything in the first place in this movie. At this point, we see some sort of like memories and other versions of Kang, and we see that Kang's actually sort of a anomaly, a sort of a, a mutation of his own variation, if that term sounds sexy enough to use. The space continues to fill with Kangs upon Kangs upon Kangs upon Kangs, like stacks upon stacks upon stacks upon stacks, as it becomes almost black with writhing, piling Kangs, right? Numbering too many to count as the screen fills and the shot finally fades out. We then see an old version of Kang, kind of like a quick cut too. This would actually be the recast. This Kang is aged, and this is indicating that uh, as he kills other Kangs, he gains their power and knowledge and is using this to find a way out of the probability drive. The sequence would be fairly short and mostly symbolic, but next he would emerge into the world and be pretty pissed that his alternates left him there to rot, and as he heads to the Citadel of Kangs, he finds it in ruins, and his alternates, played by different actors of course, are laying in bloody piles on the floor. They strain to Kang that he must escape, and that there's only us left to conquer, as the title card comes into view against a black background. The title would read, Kang Dynasty. But as it starts to slowly fade, you would see the Kang start to fade out, and then you'd start to see Doom, for at least a couple of frames, fade in ever so slightly. Alright, this is technically the start of Act 1, okay? That's technically, technically, it's te it's technically the start of Act 1. We open on a young Kang, in a setting similar to what we've seen in the comics that feature Kangs, of course, far into the future, and he's doing something that a normal happy person does, riding some future bike or eating some future noodles or something. He's about 20, and he's only there for a moment when a portal opens underneath him and he's flung onto a rock in an endless void of space. He sees what appears to be a corpse laying on the ground and walks up. It's a mummified guy, like just kind of laying there dead, but oh, jump scare, he's alive. And he's all like, oh, hey man, where'd you come from? The young Kang, uh, we're gonna just call him Nate from now on, replies in confusion that he was just doing something else. Them chatting could be how we get young Kang's short life recap, talk about how things are, how he's bored, introduces questionable lineage, spoiler alert, he's a Stark in my head canon, and I'll get to why eventually. So old Kang ports in, and the corpse guy goes like, oh, you, and just kind of goes back to laying there. There's a bit of a little jokey joke from the young Kang, and a bit of a quip, and the old Kang does his sort of mean thing and takes them on a trip into the time stream. He recaps the idea of the timeline, how his variants try to police them, control them, destroy them, and sort of how the events of Loki started to curb the problem, but there was still a citadel to take care of. And the problem that is though that somebody's taken them out, and we don't know who that is yet. So now he's got to teach the young Kang, Nate, everything he knows so that he can protect him and thus his variance against the guy chasing him. His young self is completely mind blown and very fish out of water. They arrive at the first moment they need to sort of harvest finger quotes from the timeline and this is the moment where Kang actually discovers time travel. This would show a bit of Kang's history and give hints at his origin but for now I'm thinking that he's like working at sort of the Baxter Foundation in the 30th century or something like that and he finds like just some tech that he needs and he sort of runs away with it. We'd get a sort of like, oh, Kang's kind of capable little escape sequence, and we'd see like the stretchy arm of a Mr. Fantastic who for some reason is alive in the 30th century. Oh, questions about that. Reaching after Nate as he is trying to escape. Eventually he would escape through a portal that opens up right in front of him, though he does not know the source of this portal. The stretchy hand reaching after him actually getting cut off by the portal when it closes. Here's a string for something else that could happen further down the road with like a evil Mr. Fantastic or something, I don't know. Basically, this little sequence would hint that Kang, that young Kang is physically capable and able to escape, uh, you know, uh, metahumans or, or superheroes or whatever, like Mr. Fantastic, who is still alive in the 30th century. Again, there's questions galore. And that, you know, we get some, some theory bait. So this young Kang is now falling through the time stream in sort of like a wormhole tunnel-y sort of setting. And we just kind of get this beat of silence and we have the camera kind of pan out and we'll see both Nate and the old Kang floating right next to him, uh, and Nate will be like, is that him? The older one will be like, yeah, that's him. Uh, we need that technology. You're gonna need to get it. You know, go ahead and do that. So Nate asks the young Kang variant to turn over the time doohickey, and the variant argues that he'd be trapped in whatever time he ended up in if he gives it over, and we then see a smash cut to Egypt. For those who know, if you know, you know. We get a nice wide shot, that's my cord, of Egypt as we see a portal open in the far distance, tossing out the 
Kang that had just had his time stuff stolen. As he coughs in the sand, shadows that resemble tribesmen creep up on him and the scene fades out. This would be the reveal to the viewer, and not the young Kang, that these Kangs they're taking slash harvesting tech and knowledge from are actually trapped or sacrificed, eliminating more variants of Kang in sort of a dangerous, high risk, high reward push to not be wiped from existence. Pretty much Kang is trying to stop the elimination of Kangs by eliminating Kangs so that he can save himself, the ultimate exercise in ego, right? So they get to the second destination where they find the second Kang variant that they need to get the next important plot point slash MacGuffin from, and it turns out to be an RDJ lookalike. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, in a cave, building a suit of armor from a box of scraps. Absolutely. He's mirroring the same scene even though his tech is much more advanced, and it's only a slightly familiar overall scene because we don't want to be too heavy-handed with this. Just a lot of heavy indicators as to the connection between Kang and Stark, because in my head canon they're related. Dion Cole comes to mind as he's sassy and hilarious. He is absolutely every bit as snarky and sassy as the OG Tony and instantly captures the variants. The older one says something about knowing that this would happen, that this one is actually the craftiest, and that he's the smartest man of his generation in a long line of smart men in their generations. As they deliberate, this Iron Man goes ahead and says he knows they're there for his armor. Everyone always comes for the armor. But that he recognizes the older version, and they argue briefly, they have a little word battle, if you will, and Tony says, okay, I'll actually give you the the armor, no fight, no struggle, just have a drink with me and convince me. Say why. Give me a reason why you need it. This is the part where we get the big exposition dump. It starts with Kang saying that time is a prison like he did in back in Quantumania, and he talks about how the multiverse is actually much bigger than they initially thought, and that there aren't just universes but multiverses within multiverses and realms on top of realms, hell realms, utopias, and even outside what's even perceivable by the human brain, there exists multitudes of things beyond, eh? eh? keyword right there, what is and what has ever been known. His motive seems to be to gain as much power as possible to penetrate the barrier into the beyond, to gain a power to make himself immortal with the power of the beyond. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I could say it a couple more times if you want, you know. There's no mention yet of the beyonder or the beyonders. Oh, but as we see him describing this, we see like a montage of shots that explain what he's talking about, one of which would be the pinprick uh, being poked into a bright white void where we would see maybe like like one or two frames of some really like silhouetted beyonders peeking through before it closes instantly again. He reasons that going outside of the known realms of existence would make him a basically a living paradox, uh, being unkillable as a result, which he kind of he's kind of is in the comics. It's uncertain what his his lineage is and origin and all that kind of stuff. So he's basically immortal. He can just he can come back if he's killed, whatever. That does end at some point, I believe, though. By the end of this, though, is where we'll get a nice, classic MCU twist. Let's continue. So the two older men are pretty plastered at this point, as Tony goes back to work on the armor, saying that he's got to change the look for his new purpose, which, you know, hints at, like, the suit up later on, walking off mumbling about capacity and power and math and whatnot. The older version starts mumbling and moaning, Kang leaning in to listen. He drunkenly is telling a fairy tale, once upon a time, and he, and he tells the story of his struggle just to be alive in the first place, to be a part of what he believes to be something greater. And without warning, he lifts his hand and is holding the time remote, and he teleports them to another point in time. You ever have a drunk guy teleport you somewhere without you knowing like where you're gonna go? I don't know what that happens today, okay? And this is gonna be sort of a short scene of Kang's past and we're gonna go through like a bit like it'll be like whoosh, you'll see one scene whoosh, You'll see another scene and another scene while he's talking, you know, he's all drunk and slurring his words, the Nate, and Nate is just kind of like mind blown at this point. But this would be really cool because we would do like three of these and depending on what other projects have been released by then, uh, one could feature the Fantastic Four fighting him as Rama Tut, one could be like the classic X-Men fighting him as Scarlet Centurion, and basically we, we see these from a distance, you know, each would be like morphing into the other, like a memory going into another memory, where while old Kang slurs through the these pivotal losses, his lost love, how he keeps chasing his own survival, never really grasping it. He asks Nate if he can imagine what it's like living for millions upon millions of millennia all at once. He asks if he knows how little identity that gives him, how unreliable his memories are, he can't even remember his past. He actually remembers all of his pasts. This all culminates in Nate basically just coming to the realization that Old Kang is just a sad guy who got trapped in the time stream. And he actually lets slip in a very quiet admission that even he's not 100% sure that he's not even the original version of his variant. He's killing everyone himself left to conquer. 
mumbling and he's not him like he's a variant of someone else out there hint hint and then he passes out nate refuses the call and appears to decide that he doesn't really like this kang and maybe he doesn't want to grow up to be like that We open with Nate sound asleep as a sudden explosion rocks him awake, sending him flying across the room that he's in. There's quite a lot of commotion and the AI overhead, who sounds like Ross Marquand in my head, signals an evacuation notice. We simply hear the word USABER PRETENDER. That's actually two words. As another huge explosion literally obliterates the building they were just in, sending him flying once again as in a cool camera shot, we see the camera turn sideways and we follow him almost a half mile away. Um, this would mirror are some of the scenes that we've seen in Iron Man movies where the bad guy surprises Iron Man, you know, like he always invites him to come fight me and he they always do and so he's like has some emergency Iron Man armor like, you know, in some situation. So basically be like a mirror of that because we're building connections here. We're building familial ties here. So the camera tumbles sideways and flips along the ground alongside uh, Nate, disorienting us as well as himself. He gets up and a huge gash runs across his face as he starts screaming. He keeps screaming, what the hell is going on? And he's sent flying suddenly once again by a piece of armor that slams into his torso, zooming in on small, tiny little machines that like whir into place and fortifies Kang against the concussion and the results of all the blast. The camera and Kang both tumble again sideways, confusing and disorienting, while other pieces of armor start flying onto him, again mirroring those Iron Man scenes, covering him in a newer, more modern version of the Kang armor that we all know and love. As he gets up and dusts himself off, we see some sort of nanoparticles, again more stark stuff, crawl across his face and sort of seal his gash, covering his face in silver, giving hints of both Iron Lad and Doctor Doom. He calls out for Kang, who stands up amongst the rubble, and the camera zooms in instantly and we see him mouth, I wish I had more time, as he's blasted to kingdom come in a huge green tinted explosion, again tossing the camera view as our POV follows the young Kang. He's on the ground, he's dazed, he can't speak, he can't react, only his suit is protecting him at this point, and you hear the methodical boom, boom of a heavily armored boot impacting the ground as a mysterious enemy approaches. We follow his point of view from behind, only seeing a very, very dark cloak but it's green looking, right? Flowing as he lifts up his gauntleted fist that begins crackling with energy as he builds for a killing blow against the young and now one of the last Kang. The young Kang, AKA Nate, I don't know why I haven't started calling him Nate now, starts screaming, you know, like, who are you? What have you done? Things like that. As another portal opens up at the very last minute, pulling him through and we hear the man's reply being cut off by noise as he yells, Do! and Kang blacks out. All right, so as Nate drifts through the, t the space between realms, we enter his mind as he recalls points in his own history, all of which kind of shift and morph as he becomes unsure of even his own past. He remembers iron armored hands reaching to pull him up. He remembers his mother dying in his arms, but these aren't him, these are not his memories. He even remembers things like killing Avengers and things that he just shouldn't remember yet. Uh, he's one of the last Kangs left and we're awakening to a power that exists where the less of you there are in the multiverse, the more powerful you become. It's very Jet Li's the one logic, if you will. This is also playing on sort of a Nexus being concept that can be used for future projects like involving Scarlet Witch or beings like Man-Thing or Loki or whatever. The downside is that he also gains every single memory of every Kang that's ever died so far in a sort of buildup of like a viral load, but like in a memory sense, and he nearly goes mad. Like it's just too much for him to handle. It's too intense. He sees so many different paths that he could take at once that he loses the ability to tell whether he's good or evil. We get his POV of him snapping necks, but we also get him using his grab powers to put towers back into place after a disaster. And as he comes to, he sees another version of the old Kang, but this one looks a little different and he phases in and yells that Nate has to escape the time stream and that he'll find you here. And he is instantly impaled by the bad guy who we still don't fully see. Nate panics and exits the time stream, ending up in sort of like an Italy type area during the Renaissance. He sprints into a crowd of people and puts up a hood and wears a, a different mask. It's like a festival or something where we see all the uh, Commedia dell'arte masks and he's he's able to sort of blend in at first because of his silver mask but then you know he drops it and he wants to like he's just too overwhelmed. He has to get a disguise on, he puts up a hood, he gets another mask on 
and he's still having a panic attack over what's been happening. He can't get a grip and he tries for a while to blend in, but he loses his cool and he ducks into an alley hyperventilating when another masked person walks up to him and asks just briefly, is he okay? He then dives into their arms, sobs into them and just pours everything out. He still has no idea who this person is and it's all just coming out. Time stuff, the variant stuff. The person simply embraces him and pats him on the back until he's done just gushing it all out and he realizes he's hugging a stranger and he starts to pull away and while he's doing so the man he's hugging apologizes in part for creating him boom it's loki bitch uh. don't know why i said it like that that was weird he's beaming his normal mischievous smile with a palpable hint of sadness behind his eyes he's now the god of stories and can see everything he didn't know that kang was just an offshoot of somebody else and has no idea how to handle it so he figured he'd go straight to the most likely one to survive this young version nate he's seen his future and it is a wild in loki's own words ahead of him are going to lie multiple paths on who to become and we the viewers get some hints at him possibly becoming doom or Kang or leading a normal life as nate or even iron lad loki was kind of responsible for all of this when he let sylvie stab he who remains because as of then there were only a couple of kangs he had to worry about so he wants to atone by giving this one those glimpses we just saw to help him decide who he wants to be and to use his magic which he does by laying a finger on nate's forehead that will quiet the memories that he didn't personally live so he doesn't have to be plagued by all of the other Kang's identity crises. This is both solidifying any choice that Nate makes, but also offering sort of a book and a Kang in general. Loki says it's the least that he could do and also offers him sort of a job. The timeline's sort of his whole shtick, right? But, and this is for sure, it's gonna end. And when he has to rebuild it, he'll need someone to help keep it safe. Loki then warns of a false prophecy, which will be basically Tony's like suit uh, of, of armor around the world speech, which we'll get to, and not to be tempted by the lofty ideals of a man who couldn't even keep himself alive, while saving the galaxy. And when Nate starts to feel better, Loki tells him that the guy can't find him there for now. It's a safe place where he can operate from. He has to concentrate now on figuring out how to get to his remaining variants to either save them or get their power before the bad guy catches up. He's given a few destinations before Loki departs, and Nate asks if he'll ever see him again, and Loki just smiles. Of course. As, as, he, as he do. The second the portal closes, another opens and the old Kang tumbles out, injured but still alive. He freaks out about having been portaled without his permission, but is relieved to see Nate. Nate tells Kang about Loki, and Kang seems disgusted but ready to head to the next destinations. Nate asks him how he escaped and Kang with heavy shoulders reveals that actually he didn't. That he's actually another very close variant to the one that he was traveling with and that the line is now getting thinner and that this really kind of brings the, uh, the mortality of everything to the forefront. He looks down at the next destination and then reflects carefully and asks Nate simply if he's ever been in love. They step through the portal and the scene fades out. As we open on the new scene, we see a village in an ancient time. A young woman is washing clothes in a tribal outfit. A portal opens, I'm gonna burp. A portal opens and the two Kangs tumble out. Nate wondering if it's always going to be so disorienting. The old Kang having learned how to land on his feet. He mentions offhand that learning how took about a thousand years. They wander through the village and are met by the young woman who pleads with Nate to follow her. She pulls him into a hut without old Kang seeing and tries to plead to Nate that they're in love through the time stream, that her name is actually Ravona Renslayer, and to take her hand so they can be together and asks him to meet her later on that evening in the jungle. As they leave the hut, the camera lingers, zooming in slowly on a pile of hides on the ground. A random gust lifts the top layer, revealing a dead, real Ravona Renslayer underneath. Along the way, the old Kang finds where they're making the booze and basically tells Nate he'll catch up with him later, showing that no matter how far from Stark they get, they all still love to drink. They eat and drink and rest, and that evening Nate leaves a tent, the old Kang stirring awake seeing him leave, and he grabs a bottle of whatever they were drinking earlier and follows him. Nate and the young woman meet in the jungle, but a drunk old Kang, stumbling into the clearing, sees them and not realizing the danger, laughs to himself and says, that's not Ravona, and gets blasted by someone off screen. It's an older version of the young woman we've met, and Nate says, oh, is that her? To which she says no and they all start to fight. At some point, the older lady is blasted away and Ravona is finally revealed, but Nate is still kind of confused. He asks, who the hell is that one? And Kang and Ravona both say Ravona at the same time. It's sort of like a, a funny moment, you know? As they meet, they fight off the Lady Kangs and Ravona tosses him a future weapon that they both use to easily defeat their adversaries. She seems to have been expecting them and Kang thanks her for showing up. She's in full battle gear like 
Tina Turner in Battle Dome, if you know, get the reference. She's basically a badass. And they have a moment of passion and love and all that, but she's then shot through the chest by an unforeseen force, and they reflexively poured out to save Kang, simply whispers, not again. And we see that losing her again has taken quite a toll on him at this point. This is when we get the sort of Ravona explanation where he, you know, sort of talks about it, but in an effort to make sure that we don't drag the Kang mythos out. Why, why do I say it like that? Out too far. We just kind of say that um, they're in love and they can't ever be together because he or she always dies. It's like a cosmic joke. But we get sort of some explanation later on that it's just because of how uh, off kilter he is as a variant and that makes him out of sync. And so he's like sort of almost always destined to be hurt, kind of like Loki, you know, sort of um, some more tie-ins could be with like the Nexus Force or whatever, you know, they're both sort of out of sync. They both sort of destined to lose. Maybe he saw some of himself in that. I just wanted to tie up this one loose end with Ravana and put it out there that all this stuff happened and wrap it up in a nice tight little package so we don't really have to do anything with it later on. Old Kang wonders why he's still hoping and wishing for this whole life he wants when he doesn't even know if he's going to wake up tomorrow himself or if he's ever going to wake up again. And we get sort of a double down on resolve, right? No more Ravona. Now it's only survival. We get one last look at the place they just left, which we see now is sort of like the prehistoric Middle East. Ravona is laying there bleeding out from her gut shot and we actually hear people on horseback riding up to her and someone walks slowly up to her as if not sure but says with relief and surprise Ravona and rushes up to help her and she gets up and she confronts the people who saved her and it's the original Kang that we saw trapped in ancient Egypt from before in act one and he greets her with the tribe that En Sabanur was born into with the character of Baal flanking him on the side referring to him now as Ramatut. Now we have breadcrumbs for apocalypse. All right so now that's wrapped up. Nate plugs in the next destination and they arrive at the citadel of Kangs. The scene is how the old Kang left it and the system is telling them that there's a Kang alive there, but it's just carnage from what they can see. They have no idea how they're going to find anyone amongst that many dead. Nate finally sees the scope old Kang was talking about and sees how small he is, but how important he ends up being. He's understanding things now. They wander into a room beyond a passage Kang had actually never seen before, the sirens and alert lights blaring as if the attacker hadn't been gone for hours already. There is a palpable stress, but the two continue. They find the core of the citadel, which actually happens to be a Kang, and does not particularly surprise the old Kang. He muses that, of course, if he's truly infinite, there is one of him that can power the citadel, and of course, their ego would be so big that they'd want that as their power source. He's plugged into the citadel, and he's conscious, and apparently can hear people's thoughts, and see their pasts, presents, and futures all at once, and so he's saying some crazy stuff. He says some nonsensical stuff to Old Kang as they approach, but neither of them understand. Old Kang talks about how this guy is completely insane, and that that much power flowing through someone should leave very little room for sanity or relevant thought. Suddenly, as they get close enough to Mr. Manhattan looking Kang, he reaches out and enthralls both of them for really only a couple of seconds. And they do the whole Rick and Morty thing where they freak out like they just lived a thousand years and are experiencing it all right now. The Kang at the center can implant memories into people, apparently, as well as give them visual representations of future as well. Both Kang and Nate go through Matrix style, I know Kung Fu moments, as they figure out how to remove the energy Kang from the device he's strapped into. They eventually figure it out, but as they're trying, the knowledge enters their heads. So it's like, uh, it's a joke kind of thing. Like it's very sort of hitchhiker's guide. He'll be pulling at the restraints, then he'll give them a brain boost and they'll know exactly how to release the mechanism. That sort of, you know, shtick. They get him free, but he warns them and immediately turns to face someone they didn't even realize was there. They hear him whisper in their minds that they will absolutely need his help to defeat this new threat. They agree and the three leap into the fight. We finally get the first few looks at Dr. Doom as he smashes into the room, enshrouded in dark, crackling with electric looking magic arcing and bouncing off of random surfaces as he marches into the room slowly and methodically, his cloak swirling around him, and he's still somewhat obscured, but anyone who knows Doom knows it's Doom. And he sends his fist flying to meet the coming energy Kang, colliding directly with his face and obliterating him in a single punch, sending all of his collective energy, bursting backward and completely launching the other Kangs. Doom, aka the Mysterious Stranger, immediately leaps to pursue them and beats the absolute fuck 
out of the old Kang using grav powers to throw him against the walls and the floors and all this kind of stuff, you know, whatever. We've seen it before while Nate tries his best to keep up. He eventually does manage to get a good hit onto the bad guy who now hesitates. His eyes move slowly over like we see Superman's in it was a Snyder's Justice League. It was a very scary moment for the Flash. And he looks directly into Nate's eyes while he's choking old Kang against a wall. Doom ponders if this is some moment that we don't know about yet and comes to a decision. He then blasts old Kang through the chest with a repulsor ray, killing him instantly, and moves to Nate, snatching him up and dragging him through a brand new portal. This is the start of our belly and the beast moment. Spoiler alert, Doom has taken him to Latveria. It's a lovely day in the Swiss or whatever countryside, absolutely beautiful mountain ranges with the classic Doomstadt castle on a hill. Doom and Nate tumble out of the portal and Doom walks off sauntering towards the castle without looking, telling Nate to join him for dinner later that evening. Nate is basically like, what the what, oh, WTF? And tries to attack Doom, but finds that none of his powers or magic or tech works there. And Doom says some offhand thing about how he's the only one that can do stuff because of like a magic spell or something most likely. He tells Nate that he has all the time in the world to kill him and that since Nate is so young and hasn't been corrupted yet he wants to give him a chance to live. This is basically Doom trying to be merciful thinking that there's still a chance that he could turn out the right way aka the Doom way. He tells Nate to explore, learn, and discover what his very existence is jeopardizing and Nate now roams Latveria. He gets something to eat at a cafe and sees Doombot stopping a robbery. This should hint that there's some discord in Latveria that some people don't necessarily necessarily want to be ruled, and Doom's voice crackles in over the radio in Nate's ear. He says, I respect these people, and he says that these guys are the true Latverians, and that he rules them more so than the common subjects that fill his coffer or deliver his judgment. He talks about how despite the rebellious nature of the Latverians, they are, in the end, undyingly loyal to their homeland, and will follow whoever proves themselves true saviors of said country. The building that robbery is taking place in then explodes, and most of the onlookers just kind of pause and then continue on their ways. Doom lets Nate see this hesitation as asks what he would do. He wants to act, but none of his tech again is working, and Doom says once again, not letting him out of the challenge, what would you do? And Nate just kind of has to face the music. This is sort of his I'm gonna define myself moment, and he runs into the courtyard yelling for others to help, and no one listens, because they're all pretty much too scared of Doom, you know? Nate screams for help, but nobody comes. Without further hesitation, he runs in and saves as many people as he can, seeing through his mask that the structure is failing. We get a rescue sequence, but as he's looking for more survivors, Doom mocks him. He mocks the word hero, saying that self-sacrifice is the least logical way to help people. That being strong and uncompromising leader, which sometimes means being a villain, can help keep you alive and keep you in power. His Doombots swirl around the scene, assessing the building, determining if it needs to be demolished, and start firing at the base in a demolition attempt. At the same time, the salute call, whatever that is, goes out, and everyone, including those who are injured, stand to salute Doomstot. You know, that doom, doom, doom thing that they do. They don't move, even as a building starts to come down and Rubble starts to knock a few people over, and Nate's looking around like he demands to know what's happening. And Doom says that he never even ordered this. He never he never told them to do this. Like, it's just, they just, they, they willingly gave themselves for Doom out of loyalty. And no matter what, they're just like not gonna move and just go Doom, Doom, you know, fist bumping for, for the boy, you know? They don't move until it's over, no matter what. The signal ends and life resumes. The citizens help the injured and now homeless survivors uh, just kind of wander off. And Nate is just kind of left alone in the courtyard, still just kind of wondering what the hell happened. Doom's voice once again buzzes into his ear, calm, almost warm, and just a bit sad, you know? Come to the castle, against my better judgment, we will discuss your future. Ah, eh? Future? Huh? Eh? Lord of Time? Huh? During dinner, they talk about Doom's history, and that he's lost so much, and will do whatever he needs to in order to protect his land, and that it was hard fought. He talks about how Kang is a bastard offshoot of his lineage, and he has no idea who came first. But the reason that he's doing what he's doing is to eliminate that line because every Kang always wants to control the timeline and it always leads to the multiverse being destroyed. His magics allowed him to observe these events, though not entirely, and he's been working within the governments of the world, including the ones people didn't know about, like the mutants, which he just kind of says casually, the Morlocks, the Eternals. He mentions that at some point over the last few hundred years, he's worked with or against almost every canon Marvel group we've ever heard of. Over that time, he's always been a step ahead.
ahead of Discovery and pretty much every new threat that he could have planned for that had jeopardized Latveria, even hiding it from view or even moving it entirely in some instances. He says that if Nate changes his future, there may be no reason for him to have to kill him, but that he'll always have a sword hanging over his head. And he says that he could never trust him. So perhaps if he breaks him instead, he may be able to mold him into his own image. Clearly, this is a bit of a trap. And the Doombots move in to take Nate into custody and they fight through the dining hall. Doom not even moving a muscle, still enjoying his meal while his attendants continue to fill his drink and bring food. Nate tries to go for Doom and he simply lifts his hand and the camera cuts to outside the castle and the silence is broken by Nate being catapulted with crackling energy out of one of the walls. Doom then tells the Doombots to retrieve him and they zoom off. Nate's able to get his bearings and after another short fight, a voice crackles into his ear. It's another old Kang again who tells him to get his mask on. And just as he does, a huge EMP pulses from his suit, frying the bots. The camera cuts to Nick Fury. That's right. Nick Fury. Hanging out in front of some monitors and whatever he's drinking he spits out as he launches himself towards one of the monitors. He shouts out that it's back and to lock it in and that they've finally found it and then we cut back to the action. Nate hears a voice saying that did it and he's sent through a portal again. Cut back to Doom who sits there without a mask eating his food. It's nasty. His face is gross. It's all burnt up. His eyes crackle slightly with power. Almost imperceptibly we see the beginning of a nasty scar start to creep diagonally across his face resembling when we might might have seen briefly earlier. He doesn't seem to notice. He finishes eating, masks up, stands, and says, we finished this, and is swallowed by one last portal. And that finishes act two, act three incoming. All right, this is it. This is the battle. This is the last battle, the boss battle, last boss battle, last bass boss battle, last bass boss battle. All right, act three, Nate portals into a lab setting and the Star Kang is there, having survived the first encounter. Nate asks him how he lived, and he makes a quip about how Nate owes him about $16 billion, and they haven't even discussed terms, and then screams, and he destroyed my lab! And then pulls out some huge futuristic crazy ray gun or whatever, and like strikes a Rambo pose, saying that he means business. Old Kang has also been prepping, and the two seem to have a plan. They've got the remaining Kangs on standby for one last Hail Mary. They hope to keep Doom on his back foot long enough to break off pieces of his magical armor, because he's only vulnerable when he's not wearing the magical infused suit of armor. This has been a thing all along, but they, they now just kind of figured out a way to coordinate their grab powers to rip pieces off and then immediately close the portals, cutting it off from being able to like get reattached or whatever. This would allow for almost any celebrity cameo to show up playing a remaining version of Kang. As they're fighting in the time stream, we could see like portals open and Kang pop through and steal a piece of armor and then pop the portal closed. So they have one last discussion. Nate finally feeling the weight of the fate of the multiverse on his shoulders. The old Kang gives him a bit of a pep talk and says that most of them will probably not make it out alive, which pep talk, and that they have to survive at least one of them to avenge the timeline. Nate hasn't said anything, but we get kind of the feeling that at this point he's probably made up his mind. The Stark version says he's got a few cards left up his sleeve to play, but we gotta make him count. The portal they were expecting now opens up inside the lab and the Stark variant immediately jumps through. It's weird looking though, and it starts to expand, swallowing the lab as things tumble in. You bastard, shouts old Kang, explaining that the portal is unstable, meaning that Doom intends to confuse and displace them before starting the fight. The screen whites out and Nate is laying in a bit of like a time stream void as Doom stalks toward him. They're on like a transparent plane. He says that he had a chance that he could have saved him. And Nate says, by erasing my mind and Doom replies with, yeah, and replacing it with my superior will, and then uses both hands to bring them down onto Nate, discharging an immense amount of power, the force of the blast shattering the mental not really there glass floor they were on, causing everyone to fall freely through the time stream. The scene cuts back to Nate, and he's somehow still alive, as the camera pans slowly out, revealing that the Stark variant has actually used the fucking Captain America shield to absorb the blast, jumping away, avoiding a quick follow-up from Doom, and instantly porting out, tossing the now burnt and broken shield aside. It's useless now. So he's going to be the biggest problem for Doom, because he's got MacGuffins galore, right? As they tumble through the stream, they exchange blows, Kang's diving in and out of the portal, stealing portions of Doom's armor, and when it's almost gone, they open a portal to cut him off, and they all tumble through. This is the final battlefield. Okay, this is it, Armageddon. And in my head, I'm seeing something like the void at the end of time, or some equally badass battlefield. So Kang's blast, and Doom's blast, and Stark Kang is zipping in and out, employing a obscure doomsday devices we've seen throughout cosmic history. He does a bit of a monologue about how it was people like Doom
tomb that destroyed his world and that he's the only one left, which is why he has all this stuff, and that his big mistake was standing aside and letting it happen. Doom then pulls his trump card, and as all the remaining Kangs start to come through portals to finish him in one last push, he reveals that this is actually what he's been waiting for, and uses a bit of magic to force every portal closed simultaneously, cutting almost every single Kang in half, raining dead bodies around him as he stalks forward towards our two main Kangs. He says something about this being exactly what he was waiting for, but Old Kang actually does the MCU twist and uses this opportunity to impale Stark Kang through the chest with a magical spear, one of his own MacGuffins, killing him, and quipping to Doom saying that he was actually planning on this too, as visible tendencies of immense power start to unfurl both Nate and the old Kang. They are now the only two left, and now the entirety of Kang's mental power, tech, grab powers, everything is all split between Nate and Kang, and Kang yells now, and they both ruthlessly attack Doom, pulling weapons out of portals, using their suits to create tech, and of course their fists to pummel the man as he manages to skillfully defend himself. But some blows land on either side, and the battle is long, and fatigue sets in. Doom gets the upper hand and sends Nate flying so hard with magic that he actually shatters through dimensional walls with his shoulder as he impacts it for only the most brief of seconds. But as we see the, the hole that forms, we see a bit of a hell dimension with a couple of demonic eyes that peer into the hole that quickly repairs itself before anything can happen. And Nate is just kind of like sitting there on the ground, like not ha having any idea what just happened. So the two older men struggle and fire beams against beams, you know, the old trope, right? And Kang screams to Nate trying to rouse him to wake him up to get him back in the battle and to finish the embattled Doom. And Doom simply gives him the side eye. He says very calmly that he can still choose his fate and removes his mask looking at the kid. And Nate gasps as his mask pulls away, revealing they now both have the same scar on their faces. With renewed resolve, he leaps to end things and we're not exactly told explicitly what choice he's made as an even bigger blast of white hot energy shoots into the middle of the beams suddenly from a source that we don't know and sends the entire landscape outward in an epic explosion bigger than anything we've ever seen shattering realities sending disco rainbow lights out into the atmosphere just blowing everything away the men now laying apart uh, breathing heavily in uh, a smoking crater it is a surprise that anyone is left alive in this scene and then the music starts a dark booming perverted version of the Avengers theme more akin to a horror movie this is bad we hear the repulsor tech of Iron Man we see as the camera descends the tips of silver plated boots hovering painfully downward and as they descend we see a single stone fall it's red and glinting but we only see it for a moment followed by a green one and then a blue one and then more and then more and then raining and raining down as the man starts to speak the camera cuts to his face it's tony fucking stark robert downey jr and he's doing the talk that he had with banner in age of ultron where he talks about putting a suit of armor around the world but expands that thought to the universe and if not the universe why not the multiverse there's a voice in tony's ear it tells him to eliminate both the doom and the variant which he very much considers it's Ultron. Ultron has helped him realize a few things after the Avengers failed to stop Thanos on his world. He did everything he could to make sure nobody could hurt his world. And then Strange came along and got the Illuminati killed. This is 8-3-fucking-8, eight, eight, motherfuckers! Plus a bunch of his property, his facility, and an adjacent universe, hinting that after Strange left, that they, they experienced some kind of incursion event. And then the X-Men came for revenge. And then he just keeps listing things that happened along the way, letting on that he might just be the demon in a bottle, Tony. Drunk, hopped up on power, has lost Pepper, and even looks down, heartbroken, and whispers the word Morgan. As his suit's nanoparticles literally start bleeding infinity gems, and there's a growing pile of them forming on the floor as he floats down still painfully slowly he says he can protect everyone he can bring them to order he can bring them back in a new world a world he can keep under his control continually embattled in eternal conflict to save everyone focused on protection protecting everything a battle world he says this as he raises both of his arms, the nanotech peeling away to reveal an infinity gauntlet on each hand, both 
fully gemmed, of course. But then the particles go down further, revealing, what are this? The Kree bands? And then the Ten Rings? All bejeweled, encrusted with infinity gems? Yeah, yes. He now floats forward the colors of the now flooding from him gems all glowing in order as he talks about reality and time and power. He even wistfully muses about the soul. He talks about how after his world was murdered, he sought out the only thing that had given him purpose, protecting. And what better instrument to use than the things that obsessed him for so long? He's clearly unhinged. He looks at Kang and says in a very RDJ way, Hi, not my Kang, and sends a power stone hurtling straight through his chest, starting a slow burn that will absolutely kill him. Doom uses this opportunity to do a sneak attack, but Tony simply gestures with his hand and compresses Doom into nothing. He basically turns him into a singularity and, and trash compacts him just in a, in a moment. He looms over Nate menacingly as he snaps his fingers, surging with ultimate godly power as everything whites out a perverse mirror of the end of Infinity War, with the birth of something new, contrasting the original snap and the fade to white, contrasting the fade to black with to be continued in the middle. Well, that's about all I got for you.